You were made to. How many of you guys want to know your purpose in life? Go ahead and just shoot your hand up. Yeah, okay, some of you. Some of you are liars. Um, which is totally fine. I'm not judging you guys. That's totally cool. I actually didn't specifically look at anyone that didn't raise their hand. But it's, it's true. Honestly, we all want to know our purpose, don't we? We all want to know what we're made for. We all want to know why are we here. You know, and it's interesting. There's this statement, what on earth am I here for? It was the, the subtitle of a book called Purpose Driven Life. And I know I've mentioned this before by an individual by the name of Rick Warren. He's a pastor of a church down in uh, Orange County, California. And he wrote this book and it sold bajillion copies. Well, actually, uh, 33 million copies, and this was by 2010. Uh, and it uh, basically, it put this Rick Warren, it put his church on the map, and basically, you know, he has just decided to try and help people understand what are they made for? What's the, what's the purpose in life? And it's interesting because we actually have to know our purpose in life and I'm sure you guys would agree with me you know, on this, because if you don't know the purpose of something, and many of you guys were here last week, so you would have heard this statement, but if you don't know the, uh, the purpose of something, abuse is inevitable. Do you understand what I'm talking about? Like, if I were to take off my shoe and look at it and say, this would be a great meal, I would be abusing its purpose, plus I'd be hurting my teeth because it... It's, it's well made and it's, you know, and it would just hurt. But, you know, and a lot of times, you know, like I said last week, if I look at my hand and say, well, this would make a great saw and I tried to cut stuff with it because I need to understand what the purpose of that hand is. I need to understand what the purpose of that shoe is. And in the same way, we need to know the purpose of our lives. We need to understand why are we here because if we don't understand this, that abuse is inevitable because realistically, if we were to, you know, look at this idea of what is our purpose, because I know all these questions begin to go through our heads. Why well, am I called to do this? Am I called to be a fill in the blank? Am I called to, you know, father many kids? Am I called to be an amazing stay at home mom? Am I called to, you know, is that my purpose? That's, that's great. And, you know, and, and, and that's awesome questions to ask yourself. And I'm just going to be real with you, I'm not going to answer any of those questions this morning because I don't know what you're supposed to do with your life. I just know this, that the purpose of your life is to simply be in relationship with God. It's to be in relationship with God. You know, it's been said, if you were to look at Scripture, if you were to look at the Bible it's in, in its entirety, it's been said that there is a lower story and an upper story. There's kind of this overarching story that kind of continues right from Genesis to Revelation. And it's this simple idea that God loves you and wants to be in relationship with you. And the lower story is comprised of all the different things, right from creation and Noah's Ark and, and Moses and David and Samson and Esther and all the other Old Testament characters, right up to when Jesus came in the New Testament. And it's all these lower stories that all paint this picture of this upper story of this simple statement, God loves you. Each and every one of you. I said that this morning in, 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 uh, in pre-service prayer. I said, how many of you guys know what word is written on every one of your hearts? And it's this word that simply is just this. It's forgiven. Regardless if you have relationship with Jesus, regardless if you're only in here hopefully to score a date with the person beside you, if you're only in here because somebody drugged you to church this morning, you have this word written on your heart, and it's forgiven. God extends forgiveness to every single person, regardless of your shortcomings, regardless of your mistakes, regardless of the sins that even you plan on committing later today. God would say, you're forgiven. And that is this, because we are made to be in relationship with God. And so it's very important to understand that before we even go any further with this idea of what's my purpose? Because if we miss that, it's like this foundation that is never built for us to actually build our life upon. To perhaps, like I said earlier, make a difference in the lives of others. So we were made to be in relationship with God. And last week, we also talked about this idea that sometimes, you know, Jesus would get us to the point of seeing things different. To better understand our purpose, we have to look through the eyes of how Jesus sees. 
We have to look through how Jesus sees situations. And if you look throughout Scripture, you can go ahead and do this. You can look at all his miracles and all his parables and all the different teachings of Jesus. And it wasn't necessarily how to, you know, like methodology or that word, you know, the methodology of being a Christian. It was to try to get people to see different. That's why numerous times he would say, he would quote Isaiah, you have eyes but you do not see, when he was trying to teach his disciples. He was trying to get them to see things different. He was trying to get them to understand, like I said last week, that in, 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 in his eyes it made, diff- it made sense to be last. In his eyes it made sense to be beaten and crucified on a cross, but still be a conquering king. He was trying to get his disciples to see differently. So last week, we kind of ended with this takeaway that you were made to grow through whatever you go through. Because a lot of times, we look at this idea of of being, you know, um, like problem-free, pain-free life because we have relationship with Jesus. And sometimes that's not the case. Sometimes we still go through stuff. And so last week, I just kind of painted this picture of like this idea that we all have wind in our life. We all have things that come against us and circumstances and trials and tribulations and, and hardships. And Jesus would say, I know you're in the midst of that right now, but I just, I would love for, if you could see it through my eyes. Because the wind, the storm, this, that, problem, whatever, it's, it's not there to break you. It's to make you stronger. It's so that you can grow through whatever you go through. It's this idea of seeing things different. So this morning, I want to talk about this topic of worship. Because it's another thing that I think we have our perceptions of what it is and, and what it should be and what we think it could be. But a lot of times, just like whatever you grow go through, you're supposed to grow through, Jesus would have a bit of a different take on it. So this idea of worship, what, what is it? How, how, how do we, you know, like look at it? And, and I'm going to be real with you guys. This is very important. Some of you are, have already maybe like, oh, it's just, about, it's just about singing. That's not really my gig. It's not really my game. But you have to understand something. That this idea of worship, it actually is, get this, it's for every single one of us. I already mentioned Isaiah, this guy in the Old Testament. He was known as a prophet. He would speak on God's behalf. But this is what he said in the 43rd chapter of the book that he wrote in Isaiah. Listen to this. It says, everyone who is called by my name, and now he's speaking on God's behalf. He's not speaking on Isaiah's behalf. He's basically saying, this is what God says to you this morning. Everyone who is called by my name, whom I created For my glory. So we have to actually automatically assume that that is very uh, important to our purpose in life because right there we can see that, wow, I'm actually created for his glory. That's what Isaiah is trying to teach the, the, the Israelites in this portion of scripture and us this morning is that worship is for you, worship is for everyone. Worship is so important. In fact, in fact, God would say that he created you to worship. He created you for his glory. And so I'm going to ask if you guys would go ahead and just give a tremendous, big, big, big fat round of applause for my beautiful, sexy bride, Shyla Manishin, as she makes her way up to the stage. <clears throat> Keep clapping. She's not up yet. <clears throat> Now, the reason that I have my beautiful bride up here, some of you might be a little offended that I said sexy in church. Won't say sexy anymore. Sexy will not come out of these lips anymore, okay? Um, But as you may or may not know, she is usually up on the stage every single Sunday singing or playing. And so, um, you know, while we're going to get into this idea that actually worship is so much more than just that, um, I did want to have her come up and just kind of share some thoughts um, from her heart, and uh, just as it pertains to this, this, uh, this seeing worship different, because it's very important that we do, you know, kind of get this uh, idea that it is different. 
So um, before I even have her uh, share, um, I actually put out a thing on Facebook. I don't know if you guys are friends with me on Facebook. If not, you can check me out. No pressure. I just want lots of friends. But uh, I put this question out, like, what is your definition of worship? You know, just, just, just to kind of see, like, what other people's ideas and perceptions were. And some of the things that came back, listen to this, were simply honoring God, expressing love for Him. It's all about Him. Agreement with who God is. Love God in any way. And even this, it's just simply work. Worship is work. You know, being able to worship in my work, right? And honestly, they're all great answers. And I'm not going to even say they're wrong answers. They are actually, in a sense, right answers. You know, and it's kind of neat because, you know, we have this thing called the internet. And so you can actually go and look up. You can just type in definition of and then Type in whatever word you want to actually have defined. So I typed that in, definition of worship. And this is what came up, I think it was on the Webster's Dictionary. Worship, it's extravagant respect or admiration for an object of esteem. And now, obviously, as it pertains to church and, you know, Christian life and being a Jesus follower, you know, if we can say God is the object, that's really what we're saying here, is that God is the object of esteem. But in a sense, guys, it, it, it's so much more than that, right? And if you're unchurched, if you kind of are here maybe checking church out, if, if you don't really have a whole lot of church background, the, the natural thing to assume when we say worship is, well, that's the singing part. That's the, that's the, that's the part where, you know, we, we get up and we stand and, and, uh, and, you know, shy and the team sings some songs and I just say watermelon over and over again, you know, just to make it look like I'm singing, but I'm not really saying anything, you know, that's kind of, you know, that's kind of sometimes our perception of worship, isn't it? You know, and, and in a sense, guys, you have to understand, if you heard me even this morning when I said thanks to the worship team, no, I, I, I try and not say that. I try and say thanks to the music team because worship is this way of life. It's not just a simple stand up, sing a few songs and clap your hands. That's why I specifically say it's the music team because in church, worship is our giving at the end of service where we say, God, I honor you with this. God, I want to give you my best. You know, worship is being attentive to the actual message that's being given and not like dozing off thinking about the Eagles dominating the NFL or whatever you, you, know, you might you know, be thinking of, right? But worship is this idea of that's what we gather to do on a Sunday morning. It's so much more. Than, in fact, guys, we've actually made it one of our five culture codes here at Bridge Church. Maybe you're unfamiliar with our five culture codes. They're simply this. It's we stay connected. We stay connected. We believe in small groups. We believe that we're called to do life together. And so we've made it a culture code. We've made it a thing that we want to actually live out and be. We stay connected. The other ones are we grow and change. This idea of, well, I'm going to grow. Just like we talked about last week, we grow through whatever we go through. Right? And we serve people. It's this idea of, guys, that's exactly what we're doing with OCC, that's exactly what we did with Be Rich, of going and serving 375 hours in our community. It's because we serve people. And then obviously we tell people because we love to tell people about Jesus. But the other one that I purposely missed is simply this. It's we give our best. Not just in our singing, not just in, you know, like the, the worship part or the music, sorry, the music part of the service. We give our best when it comes to our finances. We give our best when it comes to serving. We give our best when it comes to helping and making a difference in the lives of others. It's we give our best. That's essentially what this worship is. Now, beautiful bride. Yes. I have a question for you. If you were to look at that definition, I don't know, you can read it back there, extravagant respect or admiration for an object of esteem, what, what, what would you say? How would you, would you agree with that? Would you add to that? What would you say to that? I, I definitely would agree with that. I would agree with all those statements that you said about like the expressing a love, agreeing with who he is, it's honoring him, it's all about him. It's, it's all of those things. They're all correct. And um, for... For example, in our music ministry, the one goal that we have is, or how we kind of define it, is that everything that we would do, that we would point to Jesus, mm -hmm. right? That we point right past ourselves. We would point to Jesus through the songs that we choose, 
through um, even what Dave said about the best of what we do, um, that we put time in and we practice, and, and all of that is, is honoring God, glorifying Him. That's all the aspect of worship. And yeah. so it's all of the above and, right. and more. And more, yeah, yeah. So maybe just to rewind a bit now, and, and again, we want to kind of paint this picture that it's, just, it's way more than just singing. It's way more than just the element of that. You know, actually, I'll say this. It's like if, if church singing is your only opportunity to worship, then you, you're missing something. There's something missing from your life. And perhaps this morning we can paint this picture of what it is that you could fill into your life that would actually help you find purpose. But backing up a bit, now, you know, because you obviously, and I say this because I'm biased, but you have the most amazing voice ever, and I'm sure the whole church would agree with you because you're on the stage right now, and they would be weird to kind of shake their head, no, nah, I've heard better, right? But um, when, did you, when did you start kind of like this, if I can call this, this music career? When did you start that? I, first of all, wouldn't say it's a music career. <laughs> I stumbled into it because I, funny story, my brothers are amazing piano players, and my mom forced all of us to take piano. Parents, piano's great. I encourage it if you want to fight through that, because my mom really had to fight. And I really sucked. And so finally, after tears and tears, and, and um, a really brutally bad exam gone bad, how I was playing a song and playing it, and then the way it works is once you, if you make a mistake, you stop and you start over again. I literally stopped and started over again four times until I stood up and I got off the stage. I literally just quit. So that wasn't good. But that's then where I, my mom's like, okay, but you still have to do something musical. And I picked singing <laughs> just randomly. But um, then I, I just started doing what we called them at the time, specials at church. Just wait, have, have you guys ever heard of that at church? You guys all have church background maybe? Like, you remember that back in the day? Like, you know, like where the pastor would come up after like the music part of it and they would say, and now we're going to hear a special from Kate Mulder. <laughs> right on, like, come on, Kate. So just so you guys know, we don't do that here. We, we do openers. <laughs> we, it's basically the same thing. Right? So sometimes you guys have heard, and you'll see on Christmas Eve, man, I'm stoked for Christmas Eve, but we're going to have an amazing special. <laughs> Opener going to be epic. So specials, you started doing specials. That word brings me anxiety. I think that's why I don't use it. Yeah. You but started yeah, doing I, them. How old were you? Um, eight, seven, seven, eight, nine. And it was really, really bad. I mean, really cute. They were really cute. And then but just awful. older, but awful. <laughs> <laughs> you get the, the nice applause from the, the yeah. older people. Oh, that was so yeah, she's so unique. They probably just turned down their hearing aids. <clears throat> but, yeah. Um, that that definitely pushed me into music, and then out of out of that performing aspect, because I literally caved under pressure. I forgot lyrics. I forgot how a song goes. I stood up there and literally stared. I just me and I don't stage fright. I promise you, I had massive stage fright and uh, anyways that shifted me into like I can't depend on myself because I suck and that kind of started moving me into this whole element of worship right and so when did you I guess kind of make that transition when did you know that it was say a passion of yours to be to be a worshiper oh probably after I've been doing it for a while and just was told by people around me um that we, can all, we all have these different gifts, and I always felt definitely inadequate in it, still do, and, but, but that's the thing is that God uses that, and I just kept being used. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so fast forward, obviously, a few years, and now you find yourself up on a stage with your beautiful, sexy husband. Oh, I said it again. 
My apologies. Uh, you know, and, and here we are talking about this idea of worship and as it pertains to our actual purpose in life. So, you know, again, you know, if we're to look at that, you know, and, and I know, you know, we had obviously chatted and prepared, you know, for this morning, but, um, you know, when you look at that definition, extravagant respect or admiration, or when you look at some of the things like I had mentioned were, you know, voiced on Facebook, you know, the different things like expressing love and honoring God, it's all about Him, it's agreement with who He is, it's love God in any way. I loved how when we were talking, you said one word that honestly kind of if I could, is encapsulated all those things together. It kind of, I think you said it, it simplified it. What, what was that word? Um, it's just surrender to me. Um, and every, kind of everywhere that I look in a scripture and I look into this whole idea of worship, it just, it's so tied to surrender in, 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 everything that I look at and and it's so I think I just I love when things are simple when complex when complex hard to describe things are just made simple and this is just really resonated with me because yeah it's just I surrender me I surrender everything I let I let what I want go mm -hmm. in worship or in in that aspect of true worship so, and that's why, it, this is why I love that, right? Because realistically, every single one of us could have our own definition of what worship is, right? Like, just like I said on Facebook, all those different listings, all those different, you know, things, they're all correct, right? Giving, giving God our best, right? Expressing love. It's all about Him. It's, it's agreement with who God is, right? But, but a lot of times, and this is why I love that word surrender, because it just, it does, it simplifies it. It brings it down to this level that honestly, every single one of us would be able to understand. Right? If I was to go and give you this other definition, a lot of times I might have to actually back it up. This is why I say this definition. This is what I realistically mean when I say this definition. But what, what Shai had kind of said, you know, in our conversation was like, well, yeah. Right? Like, so when you think about expressing love for, it's this idea of surrendering everything I have everything I have, everything I am for him. When you think about agreement with who God is, it's surrendering, you know, even my perceptions of who I think he needs to be for me. It's surrendering my will to say, God, this is who you are, right? Or, or honoring God. It's this idea that I'm going to surrender everything that I am, everything that I have, just simply to say, God, you're worth it. And that's why I love this idea of surrender. And now, yeah. you had even shared, Shai, that, uh, that verse in, yeah. in Romans, right? Romans 6.13, it says, it just starts with giving yourselves to God. And there it is. Give yourselves to God. Surrender your whole being to Him. To me, that just is, is what I do when I posture myself in worship. And, yeah. and it's, it's the fact of, like, I'm not the most important person in worship. When I, when I come to that element of surrender, you are God. Yeah. That's what I'm saying, and it's, it's, pointing, it's pointing to him, and, and I'm just wanting to make him look good. Right, right. And here's the thing, I, and I know when we say the word surrender, it's a tough word to hear, isn't it? It's like the same thing, you know, if I was to say, well, you just need to submit. You know, it's a tough thing, you know, to actually, you know, like look at and say, hi, I think I can apply that to my life, you know, this idea of surrender. Because here's the problem with surrender. This is what you're doing, okay? You're giving God control. And like we learned last week, right, when we talked about this whole idea of, you know, going through a tough time and looking at it different and being, being able to see it as an opportunity to grow, it's tough because, as we learned last week, our natural response when we're faced with danger, when we're faced with, you know, circumstance that's hard, right, what did we learn last week? Our, our natural response is to fight or it's to flight, right? It's to, it's to, like, rise up and fight against it or it's to choose to just take flight and get away from it, Right? Both of those things, and I said this last week, both of those things ultimately are rooted in this idea that I'm going to control the situation, right? 
If I rise up and fight, what am I trying to do? I'm trying to control the situation. I'm trying to control the outcome. If I decide that I'm going to take flight, I'm trying to control how my life is affected by that circumstance. I'm trying to control the outcome of whatever circumstance I find myself in. And so when we say, you know, this idea of worship and your purpose being so tied to understanding what true worship is, it's hard. Because what we're doing is the exact same thing as we learned last week, is we're saying, God, you take the reins. God, I surrender who I am to you. Go ahead. It makes me think, well, like that whole aspect is terrifying, and it makes me think, too, of, of men who are in the army and had to actually come to that point of, I can no longer do anything, and I have to surrender, like have to wave that that white flag and mm. give over control. And really, in essence, it's just giving up your rights, right? Like, as much as you're entitled to them, but, but the aspect of first, okay, I'm gonna give you, I'm gonna give you the rights to my life and the rights to what I really wanna control, because we mm. just naturally wanna control mm. whatever we possibly can. I think essentially this idea of surrender as it pertains to worship is realistically us just saying, God, like, like my purpose is your purpose, right? When you think back to Isaiah 43, you were created for my glory. This is God saying, you're created for my glory. This idea of surrendering who we are in our wholeness, right? Surrender your whole being to him is us us essentially just saying, God, your, like, your purpose matters way more than mine. And here's the, here's the problem with that statement. We're doing a series called You Were Made To, where hopefully you would get a better idea of your purpose in life. And so the temptation might be to be a little discouraged and thinking like, I'm here to find my purpose, but now you're just telling me it's just God's purpose that matters. My simple response would be, well, yeah. Because that's what we're created for. We're created to give him glory. We're created, just as he says here, to surrender our whole being to him. Paul actually carries on this verse. This is how he finishes it. And he says, to be used for his righteous purposes. Isn't that amazing? That when we choose to surrender, just like Shai said, I love that analogy of the soldier waving the white flag. That soldier comes out of that, you know, that foxhole waving the white flag, and he doesn't go and give terms to the person that he's surrendering to. He doesn't say, yeah, I'm surrendering uh, that land over there, but me and my homies, we're going to keep this land over here. That's not how it works. True surrender is saying, God, it's, it's everything. For God, for your righteous purposes. And I, and I just, I love the simplicity of that. But like you say, that's scary, isn't it? Like why do you have why why would it be so scary? Because I want to naturally control everything and anything that I possibly can. Right, right. So I think I think just it's again it's all about me. It becomes all about me, and I can do it best, and I can do it this way, and I can do mm. it the way I want it. When that's probably not going to be the best. Yeah. Now, Shai, we had kind of started kind of processing this whole idea of surrender and, and worship based on actually a dream that you had. And how many of you guys know that God can speak to you through your dreams? You know, it's, sometimes it's crazy pizza. That's totally fine, right? But sometimes it's actually God wanting to speak to you, God wanting to encourage you. And so, Shai, you had this profoundly weird but honestly kind of awesome dream. How, how, did, like, how did it start? Um, so it's just me and I'm walking up to this massive, massive warehouse and I go inside and it's miles and miles of shelves and it's full, but it's, it, was it dark? Was it oh, light? It was dark. Yeah. It was very dark and gray. Yeah. So actually, I think my whole dream was just in gray or black and white. There's no color, no color whatsoever. And it was, it was full of what you wouldn't expect like boxes or crates right yeah. like the shelves didn't have boxes right or crates on them no but they were full they're full everything so was full what was warehouse. what was on the shelves um this is where it's weird is that on every shelf there was people who were not dead they're alive but 
I'll just give you the picture because I don't know how else to explain it. They were literally like this. Just hunched over. Yeah, just like hunched over. But they were, there was no eye contact. There was no anything. They were, yet they were alive. But for no other purpose than just being a lump on that shelf. So literally just taking up space. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Useless. And they were all dusty. Right, right, right. No, in that, in that yeah, dusty, dusty, lifeless lumps of people. Did you know the people? Are they here today? No? Just no, checking. I didn't recognize them. Just anyone. checking, just checking. You weren't there. Okay, good. <laughs> Woo. Um, now, in, in this dream, now, were you, were you, like, what was going through your head when you're seeing these people? Like, um, I... I kind of at that moment, I realized I wasn't by myself and that there was, like, God was with me just, like, in presence. I didn't, there was no body or anything, but I just, I knew that there was something, with, someone with me and I could feel his sadness. And I think in me, I'm just kind of like, like, oh my goodness, this is crazy. Um, but I could just feel the tremendous sadness um, from God that these people were just taking up space. Yeah, because you know, I, I knew that all of these people were people that he had spoken specific purpose and specific destiny, and they had specific giftings, and they literally <laughs> chose to put themselves on that shelf. No one else put them there but themselves. And I just, I knew that, and that was, that was the heartbreaking sadness that I had, had felt so what did what did you do? Um, I literally this this is me just being really honest. I didn't really think about the people at all. I was the the thing I was most concerned with was how do I not ever get here? How do I not ever put myself on the shelf? How do I not ever ever come here ever ever never? And that was it was like so panicky that I, I asked that question, how do I not ever come here? So what did, what did he say? Did he respond? Yeah. And it was simple. The only thing that, that I heard was, and it was like instant, it was just remain in me. Remain in me. Yeah. So do you think you know, because when we look at this verse, give yourselves to God, surrender your whole being to him. Do you think that remain in me is, is it different than surrender? Um, is it, it's, it is that, but it's so much more. Like, remaining is, it's like, surrender is, to me is almost the one and done. Like, when I became a Christian, when I gave my heart to Jesus and said, I want you to be, in control of my life. I don't want to take it and be in charge anymore. That was surrender. But again, to remain in him, he is asking so much more. He's asking for the continual surrender of me coming back continually and surrendering my life in different areas and different aspects. And, and a part of the, the dream that was really interesting is when, when these people were just sitting on the shelves, they were holding on to whatever they were holding on to, but I knew that they were holding on to fear or they were holding on to unforgiveness or they were holding on to offense or pride or entitlement. And that, that's something that I hold on to very easily. Well, it's interesting because each of those things that you listed, a lot of times we hold on to those because we think we're owed that. Do you know what I mean? Like we, we, we actually, we take it a step further and we say, I have a right to hold on to this. I have a right to hold on to bitterness. I have a right to hold on to entitlement because my mom says I'm good enough and I'm smart enough and doggone it, people like me. You know, and like we kind of hold on to those things. And, and I love that, you know, this idea of, you know, surrender because realistically, I'll be real with you, this verse right here has been used numerous times in, 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 in uh, I guess, an effort to simply say, guys, who wants Jesus? Who wants to give their life over to him right now? 
And so it's true, like you say, you know, this idea of remain in me, it is surrender, but it's so much more than just that one and done type of thing. It's so much more than just that one opportunity where you say, God, I'm surrendering my whole life to you. Because how many of you guys know that if you make a decision for God on a Sunday, Mondays come with a whole new set of opportunities, don't they? Right? To perhaps not surrender, to perhaps not give up, to perhaps, you know, not give, you know, into this, like this, this, this God who loves you and wants his best for you and wants the best out of you. It's, it's honestly, it's, it's like this branch. I actually stole this branch this morning from someone's tree. No, I'm just joking. I actually, we drove into Police Point Park and I found this branch. It had been handily cut off, you know, by, by the park's people because it was probably overhanging into the road. But when you look at this tree, it's not really a tree anymore, is it? It's a branch. And if you guys will notice something about the branch, how, may, how much fruit do you see on this branch? Well, zip, zero, zilch, right? It's, it's like when Jesus was talking in, uh, and this is actually shy, kind of got this idea for this, you know, like in this dream where he simply said, remain in me. Those of you that have ever read John 15 would know that Jesus actually says this. Go ahead and throw that verse up there. It says, I am the vine and you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. And see, this idea of worship, as it pertains to our purpose in life, is this idea of continual surrender. It's this idea of, God, I'm going to do whatever I can to remain in you. I'm going to do whatever I can to continually surrender to you, God. Because a lot of us, and forgive me if I'm stepping on your toes, a lot of us live this life Monday through Saturday. And then we expect to come to church and say, God, I'm plugging into you this morning. And we expect to see fruit come from our lives. Because God, that's what I do. I'm here to worship you on a Sunday. And God didn't say, remain in me on the Sabbath. Remain in me when you're in church. Remain in me when you're singing. Jesus said, remain in me and I in you. Because I don't know about you, but I don't want to be this type of tree. I want to be a tree that bears fruit all the time. I want to be a tree that makes a difference in the lives of others on an ongoing, continual basis. And that's how, guys, this is how we bear fruit. When we choose to say, God, I'm remaining in you by continually surrendering myself in worship. Again, again, for your purposes, God. Not for mine. This is what's so great. This tree doesn't determine, this branch doesn't determine where the fruit goes on itself. This tree, this branch doesn't determine what type of fruit it grows. The branch produces the fruit of the root of the vine. And so it's our job, guys, not, not. Please hear me on this. If you're a branch that's showing up on a Sunday morning, expecting to get energized and like recharged and like, yeah, that's me, I'm going to live, I'm going to do this. And then you go and the very first thing you do is choose to not surrender a certain area of your life, whether it be bitterness or offense or unforgiveness or entitlement or pride. You're just a branch. That's why Jesus, remain in me and I in you and you will bear much fruit. Because apart from me, this is what you look like. Don't be a branch. Turn to your neighbor and say, I'm not a branch. Thanks to Police Point Park for providing sermon material. That was really awkward in the van <laughs> with my kids underneath it. Now I'm just saying. So, Shai, as we quickly close... How, how do we do this? How do we remain? Well, I think it just needs to be simple. It's, it's the how-to is, is worship. And um, it's where we make our entire life point to Christ. Everything that we do, our daily everything, that that is 
pointing to Jesus, that that is giving him more. That is, that that's, that's our worship. That's who we are. You know, it's, it's, it's cool. I don't know if you guys have ever read the message version of the Bible, but I'm going to read this portion out of Romans 12. And this is Paul, okay, speaking to the church in Rome. And, you know, I'm sure some of you guys have heard this verse. It's be transformed by the renewing of your mind kind of portion. But I love how Paul writes it in the message version or how Eugene Patterson writes it. This is what he says in Romans 12. He says, so here's what I want you to do. Okay? As if you just really need to like super clear instructions on how to remain in Him. Okay? Listen to this. For those of you taking notes, you need to write down this next part. It says, take your everyday, ordinary, ho-hum, boring, sleeping life. I might have added a few words. You're sleeping. You're eating. You're going to work. You're walking around life. Basically what he's saying is like, take everything you are. Because a lot of us, a lot of us have that assumption that I'm going to worship on Sunday, I'm going to bring my best on Sunday, and Paul would say, "No, take everything you are, take your whole life, your boring life, your everyday, your ordinary life, your average life, your above average life, your work life, your sleeping life. Take it. And this is what he says, and place it before God as an offering." That's this idea of surrendering. That's this idea of remaining. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do for Him. And he continues. He says, don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God. On God, You'll be changed from the inside out. Readily recognize what He wants from you and quickly respond to it. And then listen to this. God brings the best out of you. How many of you guys want your life to reflect your best? How many of you guys want your life to reflect God's best in you and through you? Because this is how. Take your average, everyday, ho-hum life and choose daily, God, I'm going to remain in you. That's how we surrender. That's how we remain in Him. Now, Shai, before we close, you had said just that simple thing about God's bringing the best out of you. What, what does that mean to you? I just think it just so encapsulates love. Like, He's, God is a God of love. And everything that God, do, that God does is motivated out of that love for us. And um, because of that love, He created me to be a worshiper um, and, and, and not just to worship him, but to become like him. Like we were designed to become like what we worship. And I suddenly when I'm becoming like him, which is the best thing for me, I have the ability to love greatly. I have the ability to forgive. I have the ability to surrender control, to surrender my fear, to surrender my pride, my entitlement, everything that I think I'm owed. And that actually is the best thing for me when I'm willing to give up those things. And, and he, he wants to see me purposeful. He doesn't want to see me walk into that warehouse, climb up those shelves, and sit on a shelf, holding on to whatever I'm choosing to hold on to that would keep me there. But um, he wants to see me being used um, and I think the most humbling thing, especially when we are coming back to that scripture, is that he, he wants to take that, even what we think is ordinary and mundane mm -hmm. and normal or boring or whatever label that we want to put it, but our everyday, everything, every time, every wake up life and, and use us so that we're purposeful. And to me, that that's... That's like worship, that's glorifying, and that's honoring, that's pointing to him. That's why he created us to be worshipers, because it's the best for me. That's, that's love. Today's takeaway is worship is not just something I do, it's who I am. And I hope that, you know, this morning you're able to maybe get a bit of a clear picture as to how worship can change your life. Because it's so true, so true. It's like 
lot of times we think that God is just sitting up there waiting. Oh, worship me, worship me, worship me. It's about my glory. It's about this. But realistically, just like I said, God is motivated by love. God is love. Yeah, there's an element of the fact that he's the creator of the universe. So, of course, he's do that. He's owed that. But in the same way, God is looking and saying, this is why. Is because I want to mold you into my image. I want to make you into something that is better than what you think you are. It starts with having the word forgiven written on your heart. Understanding that I can live up to that. Because God, you're worthy of my surrender. And so, Father, I choose to remain in you. Because this is who I am. It's not just something I do.